afternoon and welcome to CMC Markets and joining to join me, Michael Hewson, on Friday the 5th of June and this month's US non-farm payrolls monthly webinar. Um, little couple of, couple of housekeeping slides before we get started. General disclaimer, um, I'm not allowed to give direct trading advice. What I can do is I can tell you to, you know, I can instruct you on the finer points of technical analysis of how to um, try and construct a trade setup. What, what I can't do um, is tell you where to buy, where to sell, um, but I can certainly teach you about the fundamental elements of risk management and making sure that you minimize your losses and run your profits because basically that's what this game is all about. It's about keeping your losses low and running your profits and ultimately keeping yourself in the game because not every trade that you make will be a winner. You'll have some winners, you'll have some losers. And the trick is to make sure that you make more when you win and keep your losses down to a minimum, which is easier said than done. Believe me, I can tell you, I've been doing this for 30 years now and I still haven't got it completely figured out. And I have my good months and I have my bad months, but certainly um, not all of my trades are winners by no stretch of the imagination. And anyone who says that they can, can they can teach you to how to be a winning trader in the course of about three or four months is a fibber um, because it took me six months working on a trading floor at the sharp end. So it's a very steep learning curve. Um, but here we are. So non-farm payrolls. Another set of big numbers expected coming on the back of what was an awful um, April payrolls number. I mean, when we look back at the numbers that came out, it's hard to believe that when we actually look at markets now, particularly the S&P 500, it's actually higher now than it was um, this time last month. And yet um, the economic data has been getting gradually worse and worse. So there's a couple of questions um, that I've been asked. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we've got um, we've got uh, the S&P 500 up here, and we can see that um, on the 8th of May we were here around about 2,900. We are well off the lows, and yet the data continues to look awful. And, you know, this is this is the one thing that I as an analyst and an ex-trader really struggled to come to terms with. When I look at the rising unemployment rate, when I look at an unemployment rate that could go well above financial crisis levels of 10 or 12 years ago, and then try and square it with the market rally that we're seeing quite now, things don't add up. What's happening on stock markets this, you know, there's an absolute chasm on with what's happening on Wall Street and what's happening on Main Street with rising unemployment. And I think that's where it's very, very difficult to try and separate your emotions from what the actual price action is doing. As a technical analyst, the market analyst, all I care about is what the price action is doing. And when you've got central banks and you've got governments throwing trillions of dollars, euros and sterling at this particular problem, that money has to go somewhere. Now, some of it will go into the economy. We had the German government announce another 130 billion euro fiscal stimulus this week. It's come on top of the ECB, European Central Bank yesterday, announcing another 600 billion euros on top of their existing 750 billion euro pandemic plan. And you've got the Federal Reserve next week um, with their latest meeting, and they're likely to keep their pedal hard to the floor with respect to their own. Um, monetary policy stimulus, where they are now starting to buy corporate bonds, as well as um, give away cheap money to um, small and medium-sized businesses that, in essence, underpinning bank lending for the US economy. And when you look at it through that lens, what the Fed is essentially doing is they're putting a floor under potential bankruptcies. Now, you will get some but if you take away the threat of bankruptcy from a whole host of organizations like airlines, then stocks have an implied flaw to them. 
And that's what's, that is really what you're seeing at the moment. So if we look at the S&P and we look at the Nikkei and we look at the DAX, all three of those indices have broken some very key technical levels over the course of the past few days. If we look at the S&P, it's broken the 200 day moving average here, um, which is quite significant. If we zoom that in right here, we can see that we've broken conclusively above it on Wednesday, the 27th of May. And we've managed to hold above it on each consecutive day after that, which means that now that we're getting progressively higher highs and higher lows, that we are very much in buy the dip territory. And I've said in previous webinars that I'm very much buy the dip. I think the downside is limited, but while these tops are in, you're going to have to be very care careful about being short of the market, which means you have to be a little bit conservative when you're looking to go short. Um, and now we've broken above it. The buying pressure has knocked away all the short positions. And now the line of least resistance is from move back to 3,200. And these lows that we saw in early February, it's absolutely mind boggling that we are now back above the levels before the lockdowns. That's how far we've come. And no matter what you think about the economic conditions, the markets don't care. They don't have an emotion about it. So if we look at the S&P, any downside now is likely to be limited to the 200 day moving average and these series of lows through here. So those lows there are around about the 3000 area. So any dips in the S&P are likely to find a little bit of buying interest in and around 3000. Same applies to the DAX. And I talked a lot about Dow theory in previous webinars that I've done, where the averages need to confirm each other in terms of a breakout. I look at the DAX, I look at the S&P, and I look at the Nikkei in the round. They generally tend to mirror each other quite nicely. And the DAX is the same case in point here. Since we broke above this 11,560 area, we've gone pretty much one way. We've gone massively higher. We've broken the 200 day moving average and we look set to head back to 13,000. But again, it's very much by the dips. This is, this is the, this is the, you know, this is the area, the era that we're in now. And you can look at the slow stochastic and you can say, yes, it's overbought. It is overbought, most definitely but it's not a sign that you can sell it because this can remain overbought for a lot longer uh, than you can stay short. Because if we look, we went overbought here, right? We went about right there and we've continued to go higher. So just because something goes overbought, it is not a signal, not a signal for you to go short. You have to follow what the price action is doing first and foremost. Have we broken higher, we've broken above the 200 day moving average. We've also done that on the Nikkei 225. It's the same story right here, um, similar sort of thing. And again, we're overbought, but it, you know, it doesn't matter. It's what the price is doing, not what the indicators are doing, because these are just lagging indicators, these here. This is the key indicator here. This price action here tells us that we've got decent support around about 22,400 on the Nikkei, we're above the 200 day moving average. While we're above it, the mecha, you know, the mindset, if you like, and trading is a mindset, you're either in buy the, buy the dip or sell the rally, or you're, you have no position at all. You don't have a view. You wait for the market to come to a level that you're happy to buy or whether you're happy to sell. If the market's not at any, either of those levels, you stay out of it. It's a, it's a very clear cut, decision making process buy when you feel comfortable sell when you feel comfortable but if it's not in those comfort zones of where you're happy to buy and sell you do nothing because if you trade because you're bored you will lose money you'll make a bad trade and you will eventually end up losing money so you know it, it is very very much about the discipline of what um you see as the best scenario for you. And it's very, very difficult discipline to learn because your emotions get caught up in that. But that's why having levels to get in and out of and adopting a rationale for a trade setup is the best way to go. You have to try and take the emotion out of it. It's a very, very difficult thing to do, but it's necessary 
nonetheless. And that is why I employ rules to any trade that I put on. So if this trade right here, for example, is 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 here. Well, let's let's look at the FTSE 100 because I got asked about that. Um, so I'll quickly look at that now. And here again with the FTSE 100, this is the only major index that actually hasn't got anywhere close to its 200-day moving average. It's lagged significantly behind. And one of the reasons for that is simply because it was one of the major indexes that's been caught up in terms of the worst performers in the sell-off. We had the oil companies, we had the banks, they all got clobbered. And the, the FTSE 100 is very heavily weighted in oil banks. So it's lagging behind. We've broken above the 50% retracement level at 6,200, but I still think there's potential for us to go higher and retest 6,580. So again, we're back towards the levels we were before lockdown. So it's fairly, it's fairly notable that all of the major indices have moved fairly much in lockstep with each other. The thing that we've got about the FTSE is that it has lagged a little bit in terms of the retracement from the highs that we've seen in January to uh, the current levels as is now, because we're short of the 61.8. But we're running into this gap here, and gaps generally tend to get filled. And the bottom of that gap is 6,000, is around about 6,400. So we've started to fill that gap, and it's likely to act as a little bit of a lid. But overall, I still expect the FTSE. Um, to head back to around about 6,580, assuming that this rally that's currently in place continues to pan out. Um, so certainly looking at this candle here, we can certainly get a slip back down to around about 6,000, 6,040. But overall, the trend is your friend. And that's one of the one of the key things I always try and think of when I'm looking at, at a daily chart or a weekly chart or an hourly chart or however long my time period is. So that's the FTSE 100. Um, I've done the, the S&P 500. Before the numbers come out, does anyone want me to cover a particular market for them? Um, if you do, just basically send me a question and I will do that. Because what I'm going to do now is going to look at Euro dollar. Because Euro dollar has had an absolute storming performance over the course of the past eight days. The best run of gains since 2011. Which begs the question, can it continue to do so? My, my view on this is that we're very much in a range on euro dollar and we're starting to reach the top end of this recent range. We're heading in to um, the weekend, which suggests that in the short term, I'd probably be short euros at these sorts of levels with a stop loss above the highs of the day and look for a move back to uh, the mid 112s, 112 and a half, there or thereabouts. So we could see a little bit of a dollar rebound, particularly if these non-farm payrolls numbers come in slightly better than expected. We've got five minute countdown at the moment on the actual numbers. And I think in terms of the actual numbers, it really doesn't matter how bad or how good they are, because the perception of the market at the moment is that we saw the peak in April. Anything after that is likely to be an improvement. So on the ADP payrolls number earlier this week, um, we were expecting a 9 million number, minus 9 million. We got minus 2.7. That was much better than expected. And I think a large part of that was down to the fact that all of those people who'd been furloughed um, in March started to come back into the labour force in April. So the, the, the number that we're expecting for non-farms could, could well be much better than minus 8 million. I mean, it's a big jump from minus 20.5 to minus eight, but nonetheless, if it comes in at minus six or minus seven or minus 10 or minus 12, it really doesn't matter that much. The fact of the matter is, it's not gonna be as bad as the April number. The average earnings numbers, they don't matter. And the reason they don't matter is because the reason they jumped very sharply last month was because an awful lot of the jobs that were lost were very low paid jobs. So that meant that the average earnings rise lost all of that average earnings average, lost a lot of the low paid jobs, which put the actual number much, much higher. So I would expect as furloughed workers come back to the workforce, that number won't go up, it should go down. 
uh, the Fed won't be worried about that unless it continues to go higher. So euro dollar, I'll be surprised if we go much higher than we have so far this week. Quickly looking at gold. Gold is a little bit of a worry. It looks to me as if we could be starting to create a little bit of a head and shoulders here, left shoulder, right shoulder, there, head there. If we break below the 50 day moving average and below 1690, then I think we, there's a good chance we could head back down to around about 1640. I think in the short term, it's, we could get a rebound today, complete this right shoulder before heading back down. We do appear to be running out of steam. I certainly don't expect it to come crashing off, but it does appear to be consolidating at these sorts of levels. If we do go below 1690, then we could go lower. While we're above it, we could squeeze back to around about 1720, 1730. Um, the Dow 30 is probably going to be a similar sort of story um, as the S&P. We're above the 200 day moving average. I would expect that to continue. It has lagged a little bit behind the S&P. And it's certainly and it's lagged an awful lot more behind the Nasdaq because the Nasdaq has made a new all time high. So in terms of the actual numbers, um, I still expect stock markets to try and push higher. Now, as we're coming into a weekend, you might see a little bit of a profit taking um, as we head into the weekend, because look at this on a weekly chart. One, two, three. Those are some really solid gains, um, <clears throat> which means that which means we could see some a little bit of profit taking heading into the weekend. But overall, overall, I, I, I think that we're still very much in, in a buy the dip mode for stock markets. Quickly looking at dollar CAD because we've got the Canadian jobs report as well. Let's have a quick look at the Canadian dollar. That is right on the 200 day moving average. So it'll be very interesting to see where that market closes today, because if we fall below the 200 day moving average, um, then we could see dollar CAD head back towards 132 over the course of the next couple of weeks, particularly if the dollar continues to remain weak in the short to medium term. But again, here, there could be an element of a little bit of what I would call dollar profit taking. The dollar's taken an absolute caning um, over the past two weeks. We can see that on our CMC dollar index chart. If I quickly show you that, that's what the dollar index looks like over the past three weeks. Could see a little bit of pairing of positions as we head into the weekend. But overall, um, I'm still very much a case of we could see a little bit of profit taking. I think the euro dollar could potentially find a little bit of a top above 114 in the short to medium term. These numbers could send us back to 114, but overall, I think the dollar move is looking a little bit stretched for the moment. So the numbers are about to come out. We can see what we're expecting here. This is the important number, this one right here, and the unemployment rate right here. I'm going to close that average earnings number and just keep these three numbers here. And in the, in the meantime, I will keep quiet and wait for the numbers to hit. Two and a half million. Wow. See, so th wow, that is that's a plus. Goodness gracious me. That is an incredible number. That cannot be right. I'm just going to double check that number. Just going to check that number. So bear with me. And the revision for April is 20.68 million minus. Okay, I'm just checking my Bloomberg. So they rose two and a half million pounds. Two and a half million pounds, two and a half million people, good grief. Um, that's an absolute, so that's definitely, I think the market's trying to make sense of that. I mean, that should be a fairly dollar positive number. Six point seven on the average earnings. That's furloughed workers coming back in, which means the the average earnings number is coming down, as I said that it would do. And again, a positive positive number on on the on the Canada number as well. If we look at euro dollar, I think the likelihood is here we're going to see euro dollar push lower 
on the back of these numbers. I certainly don't see any reason whatsoever um, to see those numbers as in any way negative for stock markets, because now what you've got is in a workforce that's coming back to the market, running into a wall of fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus, which net net should be positive for stocks. It's going to be negative for the dollar. It's going to be positive for the dollar as well. So for me, I think euro dollar is going to come lower quite a little bit. I may find a little bit of support or around about 112.70, 112.80, but dollar yen is probably going to head back towards around about 109.50, 109.10. But overall, that's dollar positive. And yes, what the market is telling us, we are going to go for a trip now to the upside in the US dollar on the back of those numbers. Completely missed market expectations across the board. The economists have, couldn't have been more wrong. Um, US, US workers coming back into the workforce, driving the average earnings um, levels back down, which again is a positive for um, the Federal Reserve because they will be worried about inflation. So the fact that you've got more people coming back to the workforce is net net positive. And you've also got the fact that um, the, only, the, only, the, the, only, the only thing that I would add to that is obviously the unrest in US cities could um, slow down that process when we come to the numbers next month. And as you said, as I said, we we've, we're seeing a push to the downside in euro dollar. I said we might find a little a few buyers around about 112.70, 112.80. We've fallen a little bit short of that, but ultimately, I think as we look ahead over the course of the next couple of hours, it's unlikely that we'll see euro dollar head back towards the highs that we've seen thus far. Does anyone have any questions on that? Christ, someone's just said to me, amazing numbers, crisis is over. Well, that's what the markets are pricing. That is what the markets are pricing. They're pricing a V-shaped recovery. Um, I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone expected a positive number. I certainly didn't. And that just shows you how noisy these numbers are going to be going forward, which means that for me, it's less about the numbers and what about governments and central banks are doing. And you've already got the Trump administration talking about another $1 trillion fiscal stimulus um, next month as a reaction to the unrest that's currently rippling across the US. So that gives you an indication of where we are on the fiscal side and the monetary policy side. Um, we're very much in risk on mode. And really, then, it's just a question of how the currencies react. Well, you've seen how the currencies have reacted have reacted and for me you know that's that's a real surprise from a US point of view that's a very positive number and until I actually have I'm able to dissect the numbers in much more detail my immediate reaction based on that price action is to start taking profits on my euro dollar long positions and take a little bit of profit also um, on um, any other dollar short positions as well, because we could well find that the dollars found a little bit of a base in the short term, and we could well see a little bit of a rebound as we head into the weekend. So I'm being asked about what impact that will have on dollar CAD. Well, unfortunately, they tend to net each other out because we've also got a positive number on the CAD as well. So let me just close that down and close that down, and let's have a look at dollar CAD. Now, I would have expected to have seen a bit of a rebound on dollar CAD, but we're not seeing that. We're seeing very much dollar weak, US dollar weakness, Canada strength. So I think the perception perhaps there is that the Canadian numbers are certainly much better on a one to one basis than they were for the US. And I think if you look at what was expected last month for the Canadian payrolls numbers, they were expecting, if we look at this number here, which is on the screen where it says minus, I'm going to move this around so you can see which one I'm talking to you. We were expecting in April a number of minus 4 million. Now, we, in the event, it came in at minus 2 million. 
again we're expecting a number of minus 500 and we came in plus 289 so penny for penny or cent for cent Canada hasn't been impacted anywhere near as badly as the US because on both occasions expectations were much better than the actual uh, the actual number was much better than expectations which net net was a Canada positive so I think in essence that should mean depending on where we finish today mind you because we're trading technicals here if we can close today on dollar cad below the 200 day moving average then I think there's a decent chance we could see further Canadian strength and further dollar weakness what we also have to price in with respect to the dollar cad is the oil price you can't you can't separate the two because CAD is very much a petro currency. It's very much driven by what oil prices do. Now, obviously, OPEC plus is having a meeting in the next 24 or 48 hours and oil prices are higher. So a higher oil price should drive dollar CAD lower or the Canadian dollar higher. Um, and if, you're, if your base case is concerns about um, weak demand these jobs numbers are positive for oil prices very much positive for oil prices so i would suggest that now we've broken above 32 dollars and 80 or 33 and those of you who've been regular vi viewers of my week ahead videos which i do every friday will know that i said that once we broke above this level this series of highs through here in crude oil and you can go back and watch them on YouTube if you don't believe me, because it's very easy, easy to fact check me. I'm not going to fib on one webinar when I know that you guys can go and check on another one from the week before. Once we got back above here, where resistance then becomes support, the likelihood is we're probably going to head back to um, $45 a barrel and maybe even the 200 day moving average over the course of the next few sessions. And again, here we're overbought, but again, here. You trade the break and you trade in the direction of the break a lot of bearish calls on oil over the course of the past few months that would suggest that we're going to see higher oil prices uh, because markets will start forward looking and thinking all those demand expectations for oil maybe we need to start revising them up and that will mean there'll be more demand for oil and and as a result the dollar will weaken and certainly if we look at the payrolls numbers there you go. That's what they did in the post in, in the aftermath of the payrolls report. We've jumped quite sharply. And I think if the data continues to, to move in that direction, the market will become much more forward looking as we move forward. OK. Um, gold. Let's go back to gold because that number should have sent gold lower and it has. So what does that mean? Well, <sighs> That's probably likely, if confirmed, to send gold back down here. So this move here from 1765 to around, around about 1700 is around about $60. So if we close below the 50-day moving average on gold, then I think there's a good chance we could head back to 1640, 1630, because those numbers are unambiguously good. You know, there's no two ways about it. They've blown away expectations. Everyone was expecting a negative number. To get a positive number, that's the best positive number ever. Coming off the back of the worst negative number ever. There's never been a plus two and a half million on non-farm payrolls. We've seen records at either end of the spectrum in the space of four weeks for US payrolls. That will be the headline. That will be the headline when they they write the, uh, the they write the stories later today. U.S. non-farm payrolls posts record two and a half million added back into the workforce. The unemployment rate's at 13.3 percent, not 19.8. It's come down. The unemployment rate has come down. Okay, sorry, I'm getting a little bit carried away. Um, I'll calm down a bit. Um, any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a quick look at the um, the Aussie dollar on the back of that. I mean, that Aussie dollar breakout is quite something. This trend line has been there. I've had this on this chart for, 
A long time. A long time. And that's what I call a V-shaped recovery in the Aussie. And this is the next peak. It's around about just above where we are now, 70, uh, 70 cents. There's a big top there. It's the December highs. So keep an eye on the December highs in the Aussie dollar. You could find a little bit of resistance there simply because it's a previous high. Okay. <clears throat> so again, it's a, a matter of extremes. Anything else, ladies and gents? I'm at your disposal for questions. Please throw them my way. I got, I haven't answered your question about the South African Rand, have I? Um, right, if we look at that chart there, we're in a little bit of no man's land when it comes to the Rand. And I think if you're looking at the Rand relative to gold, um, then it's very, very difficult to have a significant, there's, there's no reason for it to strengthen, but it is at the moment. We're getting a little bit of, we've had a little bit of a bounce back on this five minute chart, but overall, I wouldn't expect the overall direction that we've been in for the, over the course of the past few sessions to to be any different. We're very much in a downtrend with 17, 17 Rand here is probably a decent resistance. It's not a market that I look at an awful lot. And from the technicals, it's not really giving me a big steer one way or the other. And if it doesn't give me a steer one way or the other, then I don't really have a strong view on it one way or the other. Can we expect US retail to regain, to gain following this data? Absolutely. Absolutely you can. Um, if you think, if we think that the downturn is going to be much less severe, then all of those stocks that have been beaten down will get a decent, will get a decent rebound. So when 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 the S and P and the Dow open later, and the, you know, and they're already looking to open quite significantly higher, you'll see a big jump in airlines. You'll see a big jump in um, retail. You'll see a big jump in hotel, hotels and leisure, and cinemas as well, AMC Entertainment, companies like that. So obviously, the big, big caveat, and I really do, I can't stress this enough, will be secondary wave of coronavirus infections. But it's the summer, so I don't expect that to happen significantly um, until the autumn when the weather gets a little bit colder. That's always going to be the worry. The worry will be as lockdowns are eased um, and people start to go back to work, that the infection rates will start to go back up. Now that might not be such a such a big problem in the summer because people tend to go outdoors and be outdoors more. But as the weather gets a little bit colder in the winter and we haven't been able to drive the infection rate down to a level low enough that it can't multiply exponentially, then you could get a second wave when flu season hits in the autumn. And I think that's the big worry at the moment in terms of the V-shaped recovery scenario, because V-shaped recoveries are all well and good, but it's not necessarily a V-shape because you could have a bit of a recovery for three to six months, and then you could get a second wave in the early part, latter part of this year or the early part of next year. And I think that's something that we do need to be cognizant of going forward. Um, so the, the bottom line is, yes, we can expect stocks to rally further. Um, the NASDAQ has already hit a new all-time high. The S&P is likely to continue to push higher towards those highs that we saw back in February. Um, those numbers that we've seen today um, only add fuel to that because they're coming, the numbers are coming into a wall of money. A wall of money from the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan. Um, you've got a Fed meeting next week where they could discuss the possibility of yield curve control, whereby they control the um, they control the shape of the yield curve so that it's got a nice slope on it. Um, stocks in Europe as well, yes, absolutely. Um, stocks in Europe are probably um, cheaper 
than they are in the US. So in terms of value, they are much better value. The only concern that we have about European stocks was the fact there wasn't the political will to deliver a significant fiscal stimulus on the part of governments. That political will now appears to be there. You've got Germany initi initiating another 130 billion euros of fiscal stimulus this week on top of the measures that they introduced just over a few weeks ago. And you've got other um, European governments doing the same thing. And then, of course, you've got European Central Bank um, basically embarking on its own pandemic um, emergency purchase program. The only concern I have is obviously the German Constitutional Court decision, which um, the ECB has to comply by um, in August. So that's the only cloud on the horizon. Obviously, there's Brexit, which never goes away and that's there bubbling away in the background but certainly in terms of the overall picture um, it's a lot more positive in terms of the worst is behind us and really it's now a question of how quickly can we recover some jobs won't come back I mean I think I think there is I think the, I think that we we do have to resign ourselves to that um, sad statistic that some jobs will not come back and um, as a result you will find that the unemployment rate probably in three months time will still be an awful lot higher than it was at the beginning of the year. Um, I think there was an expectation that the US unemployment rate will be at 10% by the end of this year um, which I thought was optimistic when I was looking at the forecasts that they were, they were putting out for today. It doesn't look so optimistic now because the swing on that has been absolutely extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. You know, I was pretty much speechless when that number came out, and you could probably tell. I had time to absorb it a little bit now, um, but nonetheless, I mean, th those numbers, uh, you know, absolutely, you know, they're, they're, they're staggeringly good. When you consider what was expected, the big question is, what will the May payrolls numbers look like when they're released? Sorry, the June payrolls numbers look like when they're released in July. And I think that will be the acid test, but certainly the worst is behind us. Now it's really a question of how quickly economic activity can resume in an era of social distancing because things won't return to normal completely. So there'll always be a little bit of a break. But certainly in terms of where we are now and where we were 24 hours ago, we're certainly in a much better place and certainly those numbers don't reflect what the jobless claims are telling us and that's why I'm still struggling to come to terms with it. The weekly jobless claims are showing 40 million you know, people out of work with continuing claims of around about 21 million and yet we've got a net gain in non-farm payrolls. So people are still spooked by flying. Yeah, I mean absolutely I am. I'm not going to get on a plane anytime soon. You know. Um, you're in a cabin of 200 people um, where the air is recycled. Now you, you could be fine, you could be fine, but I think you're gonna, it's going to have to take an awful lot to convince me to get on a plane, not because I'm worried about going anywhere, it's because I'm worried about getting back and any potential quarantines that might be put in place while you're away. You know, and I think that's the thing you have to think about. It's not about the physical act of getting on a plane. It's a physical act, you go there, you go to wherever it is you're going, what are you gonna find there? And will you be able to get back? You know, I, I still remember all those pictures of people stranded um, as the COVID crisis started rippling across our screens in February, March. Um, we're staying in hotels and quarantined in hotels. So I think, you know, there's an awful lot of human behavior that needs to forget the events of the last three or four months. And that's only gonna happen, say a year from now, when people will start to feel a lot more comfortable about moving around, getting on planes, getting on a train, getting on a crowded bus, getting on a crowded tube train. You're gonna have, to, people are gonna to have to modify their behavior to become more confident because governments put the fear of God into them.
And that's not something, you know, stay at home, control the virus, do this, do that. And now suddenly you're letting people out. And it's very true. It's very easy to shut an economy down. It's a lot harder to start it back up again. Because an economy is made up of human beings with the same emotions, hope, greed, fear, and everything else. And they have to regain their consumer confidence. So I will be looking closely at consumer confidence numbers to gauge whether or not that confidence is returning and people are confident that they feel that they can spend money. And it's very difficult if you're worried that you may not um, have a job in three to six months' time because there's still feeling the effects of this pandemic and we'll be doing so for the rest of this year. Um, yeah, and absolutely, there may well be a second and third outbreak of this COVID-19. And this is the thing that you know concerns me, not so much now in the summer months, it's about in the autumn when the weather gets colder. I think in the summer, because more people go outside, there's less risk of it transmitting. But as more people start to stay indoors more and then you've got obviously hot tubes and trains and everything else and people start to mingle more the risk of infection goes up and that's always the worry so while i'm you know while i look at these numbers and think yeah this is bullish for stocks in the short to medium term the tail risk the tail risk is always a second wave that's not going to happen in the next two or three months you may see infection rates move about a bit but unless you completely eradicate the infection rate by the autumn then you run the risk of a second wave or even a third wave. And there's no vaccine, absolutely. There are, I mean, there's no vaccine for the common cold. And then the common cold is a coronavirus. It's a mild coronavirus, but it's a coronavirus. Uh, this one is slightly more aggressive. And as a result, you may find that it mutates, which means that you may not find an effective vaccine for it. I think the best we could hope for is a treatment as opposed to a vaccine. If you can get a treatment for it, then it's probably not so bad, but I doubt that you'll get a vaccine for it. Um, okay, so let's see what else have we got here in terms of questions. We got asked about the layouts. Um, is it possible to copy the layout you've got there? Well, I mean, these layouts I constructed myself. If you go to where, the, where it says watch lists, this is something that I, that I showed um, uh, a, a young lady called Alison earlier about how to con construct a watch list. It's a fairly straightforward process. I've constructed these watch lists over the course of the last three, four, five years. So there's quite a lot, but nonetheless, they're very easy to construct. So you go watch list, create new watch list. You, you give the watch list a name just by typing it in there. So we'll call it test one or just test even and then do that. So that's there and then you go to products and go to the library and the library it lists all the products in the asset classes there uh, so you go to crypto and that loads all the cryptos and you go to commodities that lists all the commodities if you know the name of the asset that you want so if you want to choose a stock for example like boeing you type in boeing it searches for it there it is and then you just click drag drop and then it goes in like that. And that's, that's the way you construct your watch list. Now, another thing you can do with respect to these watch lists is you can also, you can, you can also dictate um, how to display the columns as well. So you can, in this case, all I've done is I've just left the change and the sell or the buy in there as well, which means that you can, you can keep it as cluttered or as uncluttered as you want it to be. So example with, with this one here, we can have a classic table, or for example, if you want to display it as a rolling ticker along the bottom, you can do that. Um, you can do that with this, this one here. I just scrolled, I can't see the bottom of it, unfortunately. But if, if I wanted to, to do it as a quote panel, I could do it like that. Do it like that. Do it like that. You can you can display these in any any sort of format that you want. It's very easy for you to basically change the format of them in a manner that allows you to uh, or, or set it as a price ticker along the bottom there. Mm. 
and then get rid of it like so. Any other questions? Let me see, let me see, let me see. Yeah, the review of the week goes out each Friday. Um, it usually goes live on the website. Let me just um, show you where you'll find it. It's not live yet. I recorded it this morning before the payrolls numbers. So go to Insights, and this basically displays all our commentary and what have you. And then you've got the carousel down here. Failing that, you can find it on YouTube, our YouTube channel, which is here. And it will be under expert views from the city. And it's already there. It's not live at the moment. Well, it, you know, it is live, but it um, can't be found. But it's there. Um, 32 minutes if you've got time at the weekend. It is a bit, bit long-winded. I do tend to go on a bit. I usually start talking and then forget about the time. It's usually supposed to be about 15 minutes, but if there's a lot to talk about, um, then I'll talk about it. And uh, as I say, that goes out every Friday. So, um, so that was last Friday's one there, where I talked about the payrolls numbers, the ECB rate meeting, and what have you. And uh, this is this is the one that I did this morning. So if you want to listen to that, feel free. Right. Um, good question. The little ticket for where I found non-farm payrolls. You access that by virtue of the market calendar. So you go to the market calendar, which can be found under news and analysis, which is up here. So if you got that, so news and analysis, market calendar, and then where you go, where you see non-farm payrolls, I've got a little bell there. So you select that and you set it as a recurring alert so that when the non-farm payrolls is 15 minutes away, it'll warn you that it's 15 minutes away and it will generate a little ticket that pops up just before the economic announcement. And you can do that for any economic announcement that you want um, because it's basically displayed here. So if you want to do it for next week and go to June, we can do that right now. Okay, come on. So this is next week's economic data. We've got for June, uh, the 8th of June. So as I say, it's fairly light. But let's say, for example, I wanted to set an alert for, let's say, industrial output for Germany. Then I simply go to where it says alert, click the drop down, and either set a single alert or a recurring alert. And you can do that for any economic data point that's displayed here. So, for example, if I wanted to set an alert for um, the UK GDP numbers, which are out on Friday here, and these are expected to be particularly nasty, we'll go recurring alert. So that uh, when they come out at 7 a.m. on Friday morning, because everyone gets up that early, and I've got my platform open, it'll warn me that the numbers are due to come out um, on that particular day. That's the market calendar in answer to your questions. Um, undervalued European banks, industrials in Europe. Industrials in Europe are probably will gain. Banks, I'm not so sure, simply because they still haven't dealt with the underlying problem in the banking system in Europe of non-performing loans. So I think there's a chance, while we could see some decent gains there, they could underperform. And that's the one, you know, in amongst all this optimism that we're seeing um, about stimulus plans and what have you, they still haven't dealt with the thorny issue of banking union in Europe. And that is likely to hold any meaningful recovery back um, when it comes to European banks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, I will be. Rec I've, I have. I have recorded this. So, um, if you want to listen back to it, 
feel free to do so. It will be on the YouTube channel in about a couple of hours after compliance have run their um, after compliance have run their BDEs across it and eyes. Um, otherwise, um, I'd like to thank you all for um, tuning in today, ladies and gentlemen, um, and wish you all a very pleasant weekend and um, probably speak to you all same time, same place next month, where hopefully we'll see some more surprises from the latest payrolls report. Thanks very much for tuning in and have a great weekend. Thank you very much.